And good evening. I'm Melissa Idris, and you're watching The Future is Female. This is the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. Now, 3,000 tons of edible food is thrown away every day in Malaysia. And that's enough to feed 10 million people daily. And yet there are still people who go to bed hungry every night in this country. The Lost Food Project helps to rescue an average of 10 tons of food per week from going to landfills. But that's only just 1% of the food that's being thrown away. Joining me on the show today to help us better understand the scale of food waste in this country and the role that we can each play in helping solve this problem is Suzanne Mooney. She's the founder of the Lost Food Project. She's also recipient of the Merdeka Award for Outstanding Contribution to the People of Malaysia. Now, the Merdeka Awards, as we know, is considered to be one of the most prestigious awards here. Only 57 Merdeka Awards have ever been conferred in its 15 years. So Suzanne, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show. Hello, thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me, Melissa. Suzanne, I am very curious to know how um, you got passionate about food waste and decided to do something about it. We know food waste is a problem. We see it in our households every day. We roughly understand that food from uh, hotels or um, restaurants or grocery stores are being thrown away. Perfectly good edible food is being thrown away, but yet very few of us actually step up and do something about it. How did you become so passionate deciding to make a difference in this, uh, uh, to, to help solve this problem? Yeah, well, it's, it's a strange world I think we live in. And sometimes we end up doing something in life we ne never actually planned to do. And this was certainly the case with, with myself. I, um, I basically was a journalist with the BBC. Um, but throughout my life, I've had little cues of um, food waste and experiences. I was a waitress for a while when I was living in South Africa. Um, and I just saw the, the vast volumes of food that were being thrown away. And the kitchen staff in particular were on a very low income. And they often had families or they were single mums. And I could just see in their face, you know, them throwing away this food that they could have so you know they needed to use basically and and i actually approached our um the managers of the restaurant and said look can we please just give these ladies some of this food it's really it's a high quality restaurant good food can we please like help these people with their families and the manager was was basically saying um well we can't because these are the ladies that um order the food and if we do that then they'll obviously order too much and it's won't be a viable restaurant which i kind of got in terms of you know the the how as a restaurant you need to survive and make money but still i felt uneasy about it to be honest um and then throughout my life since then there's been little experiences i've had um i met this amazing guy called robert egger in the us i was sent on a an ivlp trip to america and um, it's called the International Visitors Leaders Programme that the, the US government um, asks a few people every year to go on. And anyway, um, it was just incredible. And this guy um, basically used surplus food to help. There's, you know, in particularly in Washington, there was like a whole, there's a plethora of really young men, you know, aged between like 10 and 14, who are committing crimes and they go to a penitentiary. They're usually on a very low income, often Afro American guys. And really, it was such a sad cycle because once they were put into that system, there was no hope for them because no one would give them a job afterwards. Um, and Robert was. A normal guy just like you and I and he decided to do something and he ended up using surplus food to train these guys to become chefs um, and amazingly you know the uh, higher rate for these people was very very high and it changed their lives and you know hearing stories like this really kind of resonated with me I just thought well all of us can make a difference but still I carried on with my BBC life and you know everything that was normal in my life um, but I also coincidentally was friends with two people one of them at the BBC actually and, and another friend called Lindsay in London who were both run, running food banks um, and I went to the Oxford Food Bank which my very close friend Robin started 
And I was really shocked to see that you walk in and it looked like a supermarket. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, where did all this food come from? And he was saying, well, you know, basically um, they have to throw this food away. So we're taking it and giving it to people. OK, well, so sorry to interject here, but could you explain? So you, you've used the term surplus food and you started the Lost Food Project. What, what, why is the food being thrown away? I mean, for what reasons are perfectly edible food from restaurants and from other places being, being thrown away? Sure. Well, this is it's almost like this kind of, I mean, as I say, I only probably discovered it myself about 15 years ago. And it was just like this world that I didn't know existed. OK, it's there's, you know, 30 to 40 percent of all food is thrown away for lots of different reasons. It could be like a farmer um, has an exclusive um, contract with a supplier so even you know that half of the crop or whatever they have left they're not allowed to sell to anyone or there could be crop failures sometimes there's ugly fruit or vegetables that people they think that people don't want to buy so that even at the farm level there's you know quite big losses sometimes you know there's not the technology there that is, isn't required or the, the the efficiency in the packing but obviously even at farm level there are some issues that that cause loss that's usually what's called technically food loss and then you kind of move further along the supply chain so then you're looking at kind of you know transportation issues and sometimes it's not a problem, but sometimes even with shipping and import and exporting, you have technical issues and silly things like it might be the, for example, I was told a story of a, a container uh, coming from Germany with halal products and the halal sort of sticker was the wrong sort of Pantone of green or it was the wrong size. And unless you get the paperwork resolved very, very quickly in terms of the you know requirements by customs then all that food you know can be thrown away um then you've got you go into the you know the factory side the manufacturing side and sometimes things are damaged or um if they find um, a product in the warehouse that is has eight months left on it to you know the best before dates um but they've got an agreement they only give um products over 12 months then that is also thrown away and there's hundreds more reasons i can tell you um why food is thrown away and it's really quite eye-opening and shocking um, and but all of us, none of us are exposed to it because it's it's the end. It's it's a bit like, you know, when people kind of go to the toilet or, you know, anything further down the chain, we kind of don't really want to know about it. It's not very interesting. Right. But then well, when you see... To be honest with you, Suzanne, I've only been thinking about food um, waste I think from almost a house at a household level or perhaps at the consumer level from an FMB perspective. I hadn't thought about the ways in which food can be lost throughout the supply chain. And I think that's quite fascinating from farm to production to processing. And at almost every level, you can find food wastage or food loss. And you decided to do something about that through the Lost Food Project. Can you tell me a little bit about how you um, rehome this lost food? Sure. So, so basically, and we started because we were actually helping another charity um, the, there were some Chin refugees and we started um, so they could have an income we started this other charity project called the Lost Towel Project um, to give these ladies some dignity so they could you know, feed their children etc and they could have, have a living so they have dignity whilst obviously receiving something from us but when we wanted to give them a bit extra um, we said oh can we give the children presents can we help in some way all they ever wanted was food and then we started sort of scratching the surface and realizing that, you know, there's so many people that actually require food and particularly, you know, healthy foods, because so much food that is, is wasted or lost is actually the best nutritious food because sugary foods and, you know, processed foods, they obviously last for longer. They're in cans or in packets or whatever. Mm. And uh, but sometimes they're more expensive and the sugary, high calorie carbohydrates are often cheapest. So sometimes people can only afford to buy those those goods. So we just thought, you know, let's target healthy foods and let's try and work out who we can give these to. And, you know, our partners are actually helping the environment as well. So 
we don't see people as charity cases, they're charity partners because they're helping us with our mission in sustainability and you know, reducing climate change as well. So wh- what is the difference between a food bank versus, say, a, a soup kitchen? Is there, is there a difference or is the ultimate goal the same, which is to feed those who are hungry? Sure. I think that, you know, there's slight differences. Um, Food banks are usually kind of organisations which have um, food in a warehouse or, you know, another entity. And they often give food to different individuals or different charities or groups, whereas soup kitchens are often making the food and giving it to individuals often, you know, it could be homeless or, or again, it could be charities. But for us, we didn't really want to focus on um, soup kitchen work because when I first started, I have to say, I was actually trying to find um, an equivalent of the Lost Food Project before we started because I didn't intend even starting this. But um, there were, no one was taking Lost Food. People were being super kind and they were setting up sort of food banks um but they were asking people to buy food and i just thought okay it's really kind to buy food for people in need but if you look at the environment and climate change which i feel very very passionate about particularly i think when you have children you think more about the future um and obviously living in malaysia which is so beautiful in terms of being in the tropics and all the amazing biodiversity there it's and I know that the tropics are also very vulnerable, you know, more vulnerable than most other parts of the world when it comes to climate change. So I felt very, you know, passionate about, you know, actually choosing, you know, lost food rather than buying food. And it wasn't, you know, a monetary sort of decision. It wasn't because we didn't want to spend money ourselves. It was because we know that for every one hungry person, there's the equivalent of four times that amount of food being thrown away. So because we couldn't find any organisation doing that that's why i know i set up the lost food project <clears throat> with some of my friends um that's, who obviously that's... as a team we could achieve we i knew we could achieve a lot oh that's wonderful and okay we're going to take a quick break suzanne let's come back and continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes stay tuned to the future is female we will be right back Welcome back to The Futures Female. I'm speaking to Suzanne Mooney. She's the founder of The Lost Food Project, which is a pioneering food bank rescuing surplus food for those in need. She's also the recipient of the 2020 Merdeka Award for Outstanding Contribution to the People of Malaysia. Um, Suzanne, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, because you know when you talked about the, the need to reduce food wastage, um, because of the climate crisis and uh, the need for us to have sustainable food production. I, it got me thinking to the other angle. I'm just wondering whether there are more socioeconomic impacts to this, whether there is a gender difference when it comes to the causes and the impact or the consequences of food waste. When I think about the role of women um, in food production, around the world women are very involved in food production and you know primarily responsible for feeding uh, most families do you see how there might be a gendered impact to food justice around the world you're you're spot on melissa this is exactly kind of uh you know part of our narrative i mean the lost food project was set up primarily by women Because I think women can be very pragmatic in life. Uh, Often we, as you say, we control the family budget. We're often involved both food production, you know, in the fields, collecting, you know, the different crops um, to buying in in the stores. And we make a lot of the judgments that go along with food. So we have a lot of power to bring about change. Um, And I think you know, without using, you know, such a strong word as lobbying, I think we can advocate for change. I think we can push for change with, you know, with the supermarkets, with, um, you know, the, what's been written in, um, what's been written in newspapers or what's on the television. Right. And, and also kind of, yeah, just, I think if we could, as, as, you know, because we are, 
obviously at the, the sharp end of the, the budget when we're we're buying the weekly shop. And you know the other the other interesting point, as well as the wasted food that costs money that we're throwing away, which is you know literally you know thousands of ringgits a year for for most uh, most families. You know, every time we go into a supermarket, the price of that product is higher because they factored in the the waste costs. So, and as prices are going to be increasing, I mean, obviously, there's, for example, in Europe, there's the the situation, the very sad situation in Ukraine with Russia, and there's big impacts with grain, you know, around the world because it's one of the major world. Um, producers of grain but also with climate change coming up there's going to be really big challenges for us and economic challenges as well and I think you know as women I think this is something we can control and I think women can be as I say slightly more pragmatic than men in in some areas of life and I think that if this is something that we decide to try and make a difference with we really can make a difference. When you look around the world right now um, to countries that are perhaps doing their bit when it comes to addressing food wastage, are there uh, lessons to be learned about what they're doing to, to make those gains, to perhaps reduce food wastage, to make the whole production more sustainable? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because, um, you know, the richer countries, you would assume, you know, uh, have the best practices, but that isn't necessarily the case. And often, you know, the, the poorer countries, they value food more because they haven't got the money to, to pay. I think that all of us, have, you know, there's a lot that can be done. Um, I think one, um, one element that really is good that works well in Europe, which I hope we can... Um, try and um, convince the same to happen uh, in Malaysia is for there to be sort of tax deductibles for donors so that basically this really encourages a lot of businesses to give. You don't want to be giving back too much because we want to be reducing a food production. Um, but as the population grows, they're going to be producing even more food. And it is very, very damaging to the planet if we're producing too much food um, and we're not eating it. It's, you know, it, creates you know arid conditions and um, takes the nutrients out of the soil but also when we're putting this food this methane mush back into the soil and the environment that also causes environmental problems so we really have to you know and sometimes you you can have all these warnings and then it gets a bit too late so we need to be addressing this issue kind of you know quite soon really to be honest policy wise suzanne do you see what do you see helping with this issue is it regulation i know you worked um with helping pass the um the food food donor protection bill that was passed um in 2019 and that helps i guess protect um people from liability when donating food because again it comes all these other um, li you know uh, you, you might get kind of sued or uh, pulled into some kind of um, legal situation uh, what what can what can how can policy help address the the problem of food waste policy can make a really big difference so yes you're right i mean in 2019 there was a great bill which kind of you know, shows the way that, you know, the Malaysian government is behind, you know, reducing the waste and, and helping feed the people. However, on a practical level, you know, some companies still don't want to donate because it's, you know, they're more concerned about negative PR than they are about, um, you know, the government sort of suing them. And, um, you know, so it does make a bit of a difference for sure. But what we really need, I think, is um, financial incentives. So in many countries in Europe, particularly, and also in some states in Australia and America, they get um, a small amount back for the donations that they give. And obviously, that is a real driver for, for companies, particularly smaller companies, to give. Um, the other um, policy change I think you know, is definitely needed is um, the whole issue about best before dates and expiry dates. This is something I've been working on a lot, actually. Oh, could you tell me more about that? Because again, I think so much has, um, there's a lot of, I guess, lack of education around the understanding of food labeling. What, what have you learned that you'd like us to know? 
Sure. Well, I think initially, you know, years ago, it really suited companies, uh, food production companies. If we were like throwing away, this is before everyone was concerned about sustainability and, you know, the, the environmental impacts. But, you know, if you bought food and you threw it away, then you're going to buy more food. So, you know, having, you know, strict, I mean, obviously, you know, companies do care about pe people getting sick. I'm not going to say that isn't the case. It definitely is the case. However, being overly cautious was at the ex is at the expense of the environment, to be honest. And if you really scratch the surface of, you know, food safety and food science, you will find that apart from the obvious products such as, you know, fish, dairy products, milk, meat, most products you can actually eat for a long time afterwards. And the only thing that is affected is the taste. So you're never going to get sick. If you open a can of something um, and it's like two months or a month afterwards, then you're not going to get sick. You just have to look at it. You have to smell it and you have to taste it a little bit. And if it's good, you should actually eat it. Um, and if you look at countries like where I'm, at, where I'm in the moment in, uh, in Switzerland, even shops can sell food past the, the best before date. And it's the same in Italy. They passed a law to say that people can have food after those dates. So around the world, it's not at all uniform. There's not a joined up strategy. And people are very worried about making people sick. And I totally understand that. But we have to be you know, realistic. We have to say, look, what is really not safe and we should stick to keeping very strict you know regulations for those those products but for everything else we need to educate people because they're throwing away good money and um, at the same time damaging the environment so um you know and if you do taste something like even if you open a packet of biscuits for example that's a couple of weeks after the date if they don't taste good then okay you know then you can um you know compost them or or whatever you, you do with your your food but if they don't eat them enjoy it think of the money you've saved you know <laughs> Okay, I, I definitely agree with you. There's a lot more education that's needed um, on that front. I think a lot of misinformation has kind of just been passed on from generation to generation over the years. And I think that's, we need to kind of educate ourselves as to what the, the dates and the labels mean. Um, in, in the few minutes that we have left, Suzanne, I, I do want to ask you whether um, this issue, that we can do something about this issue. I mean, it would be wonderful if we all went out and set up our own little food banks and uh, did something to address lost food or food wastage, but what, what role can we play individually to help reduce the scale of the problem? Sure. Well, I think the biggest lesson I've learned myself is collaboration is the key. So I think that, you know, one person on their own can't do very much, but together as an entity um, and recognizing each other's skills and working together, like we can't do all this on our own. We work with so many amazing charities who help us to distribute the food. We can't, you know, we have so much food, we can't control every single, you know, banana that goes out or, you know, shampoo products. So we're very reliant on, on all the, our products charity partners at the same time we really rely on our donors our food donors and you know the the companies the corporates that are helping to to help us and you know it's and also even the media with yourselves or you know with the medeca award you know it's been you know amazing having that platform um and that recognition that people i think you know, begin to think, oh, okay, this this must be quite an interesting, you know, project. So I think that, you know, proper recognition, uh, sharing education, awareness, and, uh, you know, with schools, but also with the public is, is the key. And if there's any young people out there who want to make a difference, you know, you can, because that's the... That's the biggest lesson I learned from Robert Egger. All of us can make a difference. And of course, you can't do it on your own. But, you know, come and work with the Lost Food Project or set up your own charity and then we can work together. And you have to start small, of course. But if you really are passionate about what you do and if you have purpose in your life, you will be happy. Um, you know, obviously, it doesn't, you know, you're not going to get paid uh, the same as a banker. Um, but... It, it's what you get back in life is 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 really important, I think, and uh, and yeah, collaboration and the potential to bring about change and and being able to help people is such a privilege. It is the the biggest privilege a person can have. So um, yeah, I really highly recommend if you have some time or you have an inkling that you want to to do something, to do it. 
Suzanne, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me some time. Lovely to meet but you, Melissa. That was my conversation with Suzanne Mooney, founder of The Lost Food Project. And that's all we have for you on this episode of The Future's Female. I will be back with you same time next week. Till then, see you. <laughs>